Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining Flowing Cross Border with Rob Keeve, CEO of Flow, and Nikki Davidson, Senior Manager, Digital, Ula Johnson. As a reminder, if you have any questions, please submit them using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Here's your host, Deborah Weinswig, CEO and founder of Coresight Research. Drew, thank you so much. We are so excited to have everybody here today. This is an amazing opportunity to learn more about cross-border e-commerce. I'm honored to be here with customer experience pioneer, Rob Keefe, CEO of Flow, and seasoned fashion and beauty e-commerce leader, Nikki Davidson, senior manager of digital at Ula Johnson, a brand many of us know and love, to deep dive into the extremely timely topic of cross-border e-commerce. Right now at CoreSight, I would tell you that about a third of our retail clients are focused on this particular topic especially as we start to look to holiday, if we can already believe it, holiday 21. It is projected that cross-border e-commerce will see impressive growth this year, outpacing that of domestic e-commerce as the pandemic is proving to be a primary driver of this trend. We're particularly seeing increased interest in Southeast Asia and the I would say so far in 21 and, and who knows what the rest of the year holds for us. Uh, many brands with global ambitions are using these unprecedented times you know, really is an opportunity to diversify their, their markets and, you know, from a Wall Street perspective, right, market risk, and also looking at new business models that they're learning in other markets, and then also bringing those back to their home market. Uh, global e-commerce will continue to be an important channel to grow online sales as brands are really realizing the competitive advantage it provides and attracting and also converting international customers who, you know, may not be as easy for them to experience the kind of in-person experience if they were uh, tourists, let's say. Um, that being said, many global brands still have not embraced the tailwinds driving the reality of cross-border. And I think there's also still uh, not from just a tech perspective, but also just from an opportunity perspective, you know, a lot that, that all of us can learn and it's, it's really changing every day. Um, today, we're going to cover three key incentives for retailers to consider as they're taking their businesses cross-border this year and, and in the future. So right, number one, you know, the, the current pandemic has really accelerated online shopping habits for international products. We're continuing to see unprecedented demand in, you know, really markets around the world for, you know, US made goods. And what we're also seeing is that online shoppers have become increasingly more comfortable with purchasing from overseas retailers and cross-border shopping is expected to continue to see impressive growth in 21, right? There's new areas of retail, but there's also new ways to, to sell products as well. And, and that's what we're seeing with the cross-border perspective. And then we're going to, you know, kind of look at, you know, how e-commerce will continue to be an important channel just in general to grow online sales as brands realize the competitive advantage. So be before we kind of get into the meat and the, the deck for today, I think we're going to launch a poll. Uh, so we encourage you to, uh, to respond. And I think we're going to, you know, kind of um, jump in. And, you know, I think we're, we're going to start with some, some questions and, um, you know, kind of also look at, you know, some of the areas that, you know, kind of e-commerce is covering. I mean, you know, Stephen, I'm going to pick on you for a minute in terms of, I mean, did the, you know, did this percentage of, of e-commerce sales, did this surprise you? Jump in. Hi, everyone. Uh, so we're seeing 22% um, of global cross-border e-commerce market share uh, for 2022. That's our projection. And this kind of aligns with, you know, what we had predicted last year. I mean, there was a, a bit of a slowdown. I would say during the the pandemic for cross border shopping, but the the growth um, and the market share continues to accelerate, and uh, and now we're seeing um, a lot of opportunity for companies um, like Flow to provide kind of a, a turnkey solution to aid uh, in this you know uh, a trend of cross border uh, shopping. And as we see on the right, you know the appetite um, is definitely strong across these marketplaces. Um, and, and, and different brands and products are resonating more so than others. Uh, we, we, you know, in this in this graphic here, uh, we're looking at you know Amazon, Ali Express, eBay, Wish, but really uh, some of the, the the brands have also seen um, you know uh, s significant traction in selling direct. And uh, you know, one of the reasons we have Flo and Ula Johnson uh, on this call with us today is to discuss how a brand like Ula Johnson uh, is able to leverage the the technology 
that Flow has to offer to facilitate that cross-border transaction. It does not need to just happen on one of these marketplaces. There's actually opportunities for brands to go direct. And I think the appetite for that is, is growing, especially as we come out of this, uh, this period um, of the, the post-COVID world that we're, that we're in right now. You know, it's interesting, Stephen, we had a call last night with a distribution and logistics provider. And what they were saying is that, you know, the, the consumer, right, because of this, you know, almost this, this authenticity in terms of the relationship between the brand and the consumer. And right, what we're even seeing is, right, like handwritten notes sometimes or kind of, you know, this, you know, unexpected gift with purchase. And that's coming when we're seeing brands go direct. And so they, you know, they were saying, and I, I, I prepped ahead of the, the call for today, just, you know, in terms of they think that the biggest growth will actually be in retailers, brands and manufacturers going direct to consumer through a cross-border perspective. So I, I think that, you know, this is incredibly timely and that, you know, the, I think that our expectations, what we believe will, will be right now, I think it'll be even higher in terms of the, the growth and the percentage penetration of cross-border as we look to the year ahead. Mm -hmm. And, you know, should we jump to the next slide, which I think is incredibly interesting as we look at, you know, the kind of percentage, you know, kind of representation of different product categories. You know, we've always seen, you know, kind of a significant significant demand for, you know, for beauty. And, and I think that that's continuing to evolve into, you know, demand, especially as you've got these lifestyle brands like Anula Johnson, where we're seeing kind of this, you know, kind of clothing, footwear and accessories is, is growing quite rapidly. What was your, you know, kind of key like aha from this slide? Yeah, I guess for me, uh, it's, it's really interesting to see some of these categories that are growing that were not at this level uh, in previous years, uh, whether it's the cosmetics and beauty, the jewelry, sports and equipment, definitely saw some growth there. Uh, so we're seeing, I think, uh, more um, openness um, from, from global consumers to explore different products, which is opening up uh, the opportunity for uh, brands across uh, different categories um, to sell direct. So there isn't, you know, one or two, you know, of course, of course, clothing and footwear has always been kind of the leader, but we're seeing these other categories slowly start to increase their penetration and, and, and traction Um so that, that was kind of my takeaway. And, and you know, I was just looking at the, the poll results actually. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to see here that of the, of the people that answered that are, are brands that are selling cross-border, um, there's about half, half the brands answered that they're selling cross-border right now today. Uh, just Rob, does that, does that surprise you at all? You know, it, 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 I think it's quite interesting. And, and Rob, I mean, is this, kind of in line with what you expected or would you have expected it to be higher? Um, I mean, it is very much a function of the maturity of the brand, how cross-border ready they are and how much traffic they're already attracting from overseas. So it's hard to generalize without knowing the size of the respondents. Um, but when we look at, say, the IO 1000, the top 1,000 US-based e-commerce businesses, um, the vast majority are doing some form of cross-border selling now. Uh, post-COVID. Um, so I think if anything, this underrepresents what's happening in the wider marketplace, particularly the more ambitious and the larger brands. Well, but it is interesting, right, Rob, is that 20%, you know, kind of expect to, in the next three to six months, I assume as everyone's kind of revving up for, for holiday 21, that, I mean, that's a lot of retailers, brands, manufacturers who are, who are looking to kind of go to new markets where they theoretically haven't been before. How, what does the education process look like as you know the, these brands are are getting ready? Um, that's a good question. I think first is there's something on the demand side and something on the supply side. So on the demand side, it's understanding their motivation, um, understanding whether they're trying to target certain regions or countries or just capitalize on global traffic hitting their site, um, getting a sense for how big they think their market opportunity is globally and spending time analyzing with them the traffic that's already hitting their site even before paid marketing. And that gives them a sense of the order of magnitude for the opportunity. I think on the supply side, the conversations we have with them are, um, how simple would you like this to be? With Flow, it can be turnkey, as Stephen said. Um, if you choose to go a different approach, you have to invest in a lot of parts of your consumer offering from shipping to checkout to the consumer experience on the site. And there's lots of nuance that 
someone like Nikki at Ulo would have thought through around which currency, what rounding, shall we include duties and, and taxes or not? How should we support our customers on returns and service? So making sure that brands think through these questions before they go international, because while technically it's a question of flicking a switch, um, from a customer experience perspective, there's a host of questions you want to get right or as close to right as you can out of the box. Well, and it was interesting based on my conversation last night, right? The, you know, kind of biggest pain point for, you know, retailers on the poll was right fast and kind of cost effective shipping. And, you know, there's so many challenges we're seeing right now in the supply chain that, you know, I think we're going to see new, new models evolve and, and certainly is, you know, is that one of the top questions that you're getting right now? Um, it's been a question that, you know, obviously popped in Q2, Q3 last year as carriers were under enormous pressure um, as COVID first hit. Um, I think now we're getting back to a more steady state of it's important. We want it to be efficient. We want a good customer experience. Uh, as close to a strong experience internationally as we have domestically, we want rates to be compelling because expensive shipping will certainly um, depress conversion rates. But alongside other customer experience aspects, which are crucial to get it right internationally, what are the right price points? Uh, should we include duties and taxes? What are the duties and taxes so we can sell landed cost prepaid? Um, how can we make sure the right payment methods are available across the world? How can we ensure the reverse logistics is well managed so that customers can return and we can service them internationally? I think many brands give us so much thought to their value proposition and customer promise domestically. And that's the heart of their question. How can we mirror that across 200 different countries as closely as possible? And Nikki, can you just speak to the, you know, as, as you were thinking about going cross border, right? Kind of this mental checklist and how, how flow helped you kind of think through not only the, you know, I would say the challenges, but also the opportunities. Yeah, certainly. So, uh, you know, prior to launching with Flow, we were using a different international shipping provider that became a CX uh, headache for us. We weren't really owning the CX component of international. Um, and we saw that it was a big interest and there was kind of interest globally from some of our wholesale partners who, who created some brand awareness on a global scale. So we really started to look at traffic increases from all over the world and, and really knew that there was more potential to tap into and really lean in. Um, but what we were seeing was we didn't really have the tools in our, in our toolbox to really give that direct to consumer experience that we were giving to our domestic customers. So for us, it was really the increase in traffic, some of the uh, brand awareness we were seeing globally from our wholesale partners. And then, um, you know, it's actually funny, you were saying that some some businesses saw a decline with global commerce um, in in you know the height of the pandemic and everything going on with COVID. But we've actually seen quite the opposite. Um, we've been very lucky in that sense. The the pandemic has really seemed to accelerate our global business. I think there's a true connection to our brand about being aspirational, being takeaway, being this kind of ethereal uh, lifestyle brand that people envision, you know, for, for just connecting to, to want to travel, to want to go somewhere. So, you know, I think that that's all kind of helped compel our international business forward. But it's also interesting, Nikki, because as, you know, I, I think what's been so smart, right? If you can outsource this to flow, right? And then you can continue to focus on, right? The, the brand image and building the brand that's kind of the best of all worlds because, you know, you're obviously an expert in one area and Flo's an expert in another. Do you think that that also has, has helped drive your international success? Oh, I mean, absolutely. The fulfill, the, the logistics and fulfillment side of shipping internationally, dealing with commercial invoices, dealing with DDU versus CDP. I mean, it, it takes a real expert to understand those, those kind of considerations and, and how you want to approach to, uh, global commerce. So for us, flow, it really was quite turnkey. They, they give you the options and you kind of pick and choose what's right for your consumer and your, your customer and, and your business overall. So, I mean, we can get into some of the um, features and functionality that we really optimize and, and leverage to our advantage, but also, um, you know, I, I think first and foremost, logistics and ownership of the customer were two of the most kind of compelling changes when switching over to flow. No, that's fantastic. And, you know, if, if we look at this kind of, you know, five signs that a brand is, is ready to glow global, 
Rob, is there, there one here that's more important than another? Um, our starting point in discussions is always the first, and it's the easiest to look at. How much of your site traffic is already coming from overseas? Usually that's before there's any international paid marketing. So this is just organic tra traffic that's hitting your site, whether that's through word of mouth or <clears throat> they found it through search and discovery. Um, and looking at the site traffic percentage that's coming from overseas and comparing that to your sales that's coming from overseas. And to the extent there's a discrepancy, that's an immediate opportunity. That's low-hanging fruit. So many times we'll speak to brands and 20% of their traffic or more is already coming from overseas. And yet when they look at their sales reports, 5% or less is, of the sales is coming from overseas. So clearly there's a conversion issue there, and that talks to the customer experience. It's probably not clean. Maybe prices aren't presented in local currency. Maybe duties and taxes aren't showing. Maybe shipping isn't cheap. Maybe the wrong payment methods. Um, and so what we want to do is help brands close that arbitrage and capture that immediate low-hanging fruit. Great. And, and I guess I have one more question as we're, we're kind of moving to the, the next slide. Do you feel that, you know, and, and maybe Nikki is even better to kind of address this, right, with, with social media and, right, this ability to, to build a, you know, brand awareness and kind of a, a new way. Nikki, how, how did that kind of if you will, drive once again, this, you know, kind of excitement and, you know, seamlessness in terms of going global. Yeah, I think that social media has propelled people to, to, and consumers especially, to want things immediately. They place an order, their expectations of receiving goods are two to five business days. And, you know, prior to being on flow, we were experiencing with international specifically, um, all of our shipments had to be consolidated at a warehouse in California and then shipped to Europe, to Australia. So you can imagine that, add signif that added significant lead time to a lot of our shipments. Um, and then the price too, the cost of shipping uh, to, to some countries that are not close, it, it's, it's quite a lot. So um, using Flow helped with our rate uh, you know, ultimately when working with Flow, you get access to rates that are just unimaginable for a global consumer. I think sometimes, you know, customers in Europe are receiving our product within three days at a $10 shipping rate. And that's just unheard of, I think, um, a few years ago. So it, it's really exciting for us to be able to deliver upon that immediacy that people are engaging with on social media. But, but I think what's even more important is, right, you know, if you, if you were to have a group, well, even, you know, kind of all of us on this call today, right, to tell people that they can, you know, kind of go global, it's right, three day shipping for $10. I'm, I mean, even that is just kind of some data that's, that's truly, I mean, you know, even sometimes domestically, right, it's three days and $10. So to be able to absolutely, you know, right, this entirely new audience, that is, you know, and, and once again, this power of social media for your brand to kind of be, you know, truly global, it's, it seems like such a huge opportunity. How, so once again, as you've kind of, you know, moved over to work with Flow, can you just talk a little bit about how your business has changed, cadence, anything in terms of, you know, what you're seeing with regards to demand, et cetera? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think one of the, one of the key functionalities for us is, as I mentioned before, we have some wholesale partners globally, and we really want to honor the price books um, that are given to wholesale partners during markets um, and within our, our wholesale world. So just for anybody who's not aware of maybe what a price book is, uh, we set certain rates so that our pricing is competitive and that they are not being hit with high conversion rates. So our dress that might be, you know, $5.95 here is in $7.95 in the UK. So we set price books for our wholesale partners and something that we've been really able to leverage with flow is setting price books in currencies where we may have wholesale partners um, and then in other currencies or other countries having that flexibility to not have to have price books if we don't have them and to set a market rate so that's been something that we've really been able to optimize and use to our advantage um, DD, DDP is, is huge for us. Previously, you know, customers had the ability to pay DDU, meaning taxes and duties were unpaid. Um, and that just posed a challenge when, when somebody would receive a good and on their doorstep and they owed $200 in taxes and duties. Like no, nobody wants to get hit with that kind of uh, bill on delivery. So, you know, I think that the transparency level of what duties and taxes will be. And also um, we've been able to kind of A-B test where throughout the site experience, we've, we've been able to show the consumer what 
duties and taxes would be. Um, you know, sometimes we would bake it into the price that they're seeing. And other times we would break it out separately and try and see what that engagement was. So I think um, those are two primary features that we've really been able to optimize. Um, and then, you know, I think out of the box, a really big feature of Flow is that they're able to offer localized experiences across every country. So, you know, whether you're um, in the UK or you're in Europe or you're in Australia, you get to shop our website um, in, in your currency of choice, depending on where you are. So that type of experience is actually, it doesn't exist quite often uh, in the D2C space. So for us, that, that's huge. Um, and I guess the last point, I think this is more future thinking is we are going to start um, with, with paid marketing efforts on an international scale. So being able to use those price books that customers are seeing and those the pricing um, to plug into Google and Facebook so that all of our ads are in their currency, I think that's also a huge, huge factor for us. No, that's, that's incredibly sophisticated and, and certainly speaks to the opportunity to grow market share. I, I yeah. think that, you know, there, there's, you know, we should talk about the challenges cr of cross-border because I do think that oftentimes it, it does seem quite overwhelming as, you know, especially some of these larger brands are, you know, kind of looking to grow cross-border for the first time. And, you know, some of the, you know, kind of percentages here, certainly I, I found a bit surprising, but this whole kind of aspect around the operational factors. Um, and, you know, once again, it kind of uh, dovetails with some of the, you know, shipping and as you talked about duties paid and whatnot, it's, it really can be a challenge. And, you know, Stephen, as we were doing the research, was there anything here that really kind of stood out to you? I mean, I, I from conversations I have, I know it's oftentimes the, the operational aspect, but was there any kind of, you know, one, you know, theme here that you found to be surprising? Yeah, I would just say probably um, some of these things that I think were evident that, you know, whether it's international shipping or dealing with, um, you know, local currency or local language. I think the key takeaway from me and, and for what we saw here is these are perceived barriers. Um, and a lot of these things can be overcome with certain solutions and certain uh, strategies that uh, can basically tackle those those issues. So when we you know, this is a survey of a hundred, um, you know, multinational retailers. And, and I think the, the key, you know, uh, takeaway here is that many of these perceived barriers can be overcome. Uh, and so there's different ways to, to tackle that. And I think that we're, come, we're, we're living in a more connected society where there's a lot of innovation taking place that, that can enable, um, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, as Nikki mentioned, quicker international shipping or, you know, browsing in local languages, a lot of these things are doable and can be done in a, you know, a short time frame. Uh, so uh, on that note, I, I want to pass it to uh, back, to, back to Deborah, but then we'll get into more challenges that that flow is going to, uh, that Rob will talk through. Yeah, I mean, I what, what we've seen and just, you know, obviously, Stephen, a large part of our business is bringing companies, you know, kind of cross-border. What we often find is, you know, some of the, you know, cultural and right, having this idea of kind of a, a local partner, right, to not only understand, you know, some of the, the customs and whatnot, but, but also, you know, kind of helping, you know, retailers and brands roll out to new markets faster than like building their operations in house. And I do think that that's one of the, you know, to me, the wonderful aspects of flow and, you know, just to make it seamless, because I, I do think that right now, many retailers are, are hunting for growth and we are seeing, you know, like I said, we're the, the number one kind of market interest inbound so far this year has been Southeast Asia and this idea that it's still kind of very much, you know, white space. And, you know, I think there's a significant opportunity as we, we look ahead um, to not only go to Southeast Asia, but also just to explore even more, you know, maybe some obscure markets where, you know, as, as Nikki has said, right, you know so much about your consumer or your potential consumer through social media and this opportunity to, you know, ad address their needs and, and drive sales. So, you know, I think that, you know, Rob, we want to, you know, kind of address this, this question, you know, when exploring the top barriers that consumers experience when cross-border shopping, what do you hear from the shopper most frequently? 
Um, I mean, I think it's the way, the reality is, as Nikki was describing it, it's death by a thousand cuts. If you're not optimized for international, it's just everything is off. It's um, a very unconscious shopping experience. You're seeing things in either the wrong currency or non-rounded prices, which don't resonate. You don't, if duties and taxes aren't displayed on the site, you're going to have a carrier on your doorstep a few weeks later charging you an unknown amount. Um, you may find the shipping is super expensive or get stuck at customs. You may not be able to pay with your preferred payment method or find your card has declined. You may not know if you can get things returned or if you can get support internationally. Um, there's a host of issues. It's not a single one. And fixing a single one doesn't solve it. You really need to solve it wholesale. And if you do, the opportunity, as you're intimating, is you can convert that to international traffic. Um, and that's the raison d'etre for flow, is to remove the friction, is to make it turnkey so all of these pain points can be addressed and the shopping experience remains clean and seamless. Um, and I think some of the questions that have been coming up from the audience, maybe we could pull out a couple of them, one related to what are the pain points that uh, we see at Flow, and, and maybe Nikki can com comment on at ULA, on cross-border payments. Uh, there we see a few things. One, cards are often declined um, if you're not set up correctly for cross-border. So if you think about the last time you purchased from Europe, you may have found that your perfectly valid credit card is getting declined. And there's a technical reason why that happens. Um, but we solve that at Flow by doing what's known as local acquiring to set up relationships in different regions so that we appear as a local merchant. And so in ULA's case, making sure that those transactions can be captured where otherwise they may have been declined. And the second challenge is around payment methods. In many markets, cards or even digital wallets isn't the most common payment method. And so consumers in those markets want to pay the way they normally pay from a local site. So in Holland, that may be a Dale. In Germany, that may be Sofort. In Sweden, that may be Klarna. Um, and so at Flow, we make sure that those payment methods are always available to our clients so that the consumer can pay with the payment method they would like. Certainly too, and, uh, and, and jumping, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry Rob, I was just going to also speak uh, yes. to your point about checkout. So a lot of brands these days are on Shopify as we are. And so what's, what's create, amazing, I think about the service that Flow provides is that you actually, as a consumer in an international country, leave the Shopify checkout experience. You are redirected to a Flow checkout where it is, fully flow owning the checkout workflow. And then after a customer checks out, card is approved, that order pushes into our own Shopify instance. So not only is there no friction with payment, but also we as a brand own the customer. And I think that's really important here because a lot of other providers, um, you don't have the customer data. You don't have the customer ship to information. As I mentioned, things are shipped to a facility or warehouse to, con to consolidate and then ship out to a customer. So we were just shipping everything to one customer and we didn't own the customer. We didn't own the country. We didn't have data on them. And I think that data um, has really made our marketing strategies richer as well. Nikki, can I ask you one Great question, point. which is, right, there, there's also this perceived, right, when kind of going cross-border that, that there's a, it's a significant amount of time for a brand. Can you talk about how quickly, right, once you decided to kind of, you know, press go, what was the, the time in working with Flow to kind of get everything up and running? Um, I would say it was about two to three weeks. Wow. And that was long for, I'd say, um, just truthfully speaking, we have a very complex back end uh, kind of tech stack with ERP systems and POS systems and WMS systems. So, you know, Flow really had, to, we had to make sure that all, all orders that were coming through Flow seamlessly spoke to all systems and then all tracking information, um, order confirmations, things like that had, had a very clear and linear kind of operation and workflow. So for us, there was a, a pretty heavy and cumbersome and pretty heavy testing process, I would say. So that is, was kind of our, our projected launch plan was three weeks, but um, I'd say if we were a little bit of a cleaner back end, it would be a, a far less complex kind of launch um, lead time. That's, that's really impressive. And, and I think, I mean, here on this slide, 
I think we've already addressed, you know, many of the challenges, but I think as, as Nikki and Rob have both mentioned, right, this idea of having it, you know, kind of seamless because oftentimes, you know, there's, there's the duration, right. The, you know, time to roll out. I mean, two to three weeks is truly unbelievable and, you know, a game changer for a brand. And, you know, this idea around, you know, just visibility, once again, as Nate, as Nikki said, right, the access to data to, you know, kind of understand, right, also where to put kind of your, your marketing dollars, which, you know, kind of right now can be a, a large expense and, and uh, rent in this uh, kind of online world. So, so I do think that, uh, that it's quite, um, quite critical. Robert, is there anything else that when, you know, a new customer comes to you or, right, Nikki, where she had been on kind of another, you know, working with another provider, what, what are they finding are the, the biggest challenges that they're facing? Sure. Um, I think th there were the obvious ones, that some of which we've touched on around making sure that their shipping goes from domestic to global with different service levels and, and the right carriers for the right routes, making sure their checkout experiences balances both the brand promise and high conversion rates, um, and making sure the customer experience is thought through end to end from search to landing on the site all the way through the logistics and delivery experience. But uh, two of the subtle uh, challenges that brands often face, one is around tax remittance. Um, there's an emerging theme globally where countries want to control the, pay, the payment of duties and sales tax much more closely and are no longer happy with it just being paid by the shippers at the border. Um, and so there's many countries now that are um, in introducing low value good laws like Australia and New Zealand and Switzerland and Norway, where you need local registrations. And within Europe, there's distance selling challenges where you need to register across 27 different countries. So that's an uncomfortable new reality for brands trying to sell globally. And one where we're happy to step in and as part of our promise to the merchant to make life easier, managers on their behalf do it once for all in each of these countries. Uh, so that's the subtle one behind the scenes, not visible to consumers, but is an enormous pain point for brands. And I think the second is we step in to become the merchant of record at the point of sale to again take over some of the risk, um, challenges, and regulatory issues that brands face when selling internationally. Sometimes that's around data protection. Sometimes it's around currency management and currency hedging. Uh, and other cases, it's around... Um, having relationship with many different payment providers and brands not wanting to spend their weeks and dev effort integrating different payment methods and signing up to new payment contracts where we can step into their shoes and managing that on their behalf. Rob, you're, give, you're giving me flashbacks on, on many projects that we at Coresight have, have worked on, especially around the, the payments aspect. And, uh, you know, I, I think that that seems to be, a, and actually there's an audience question around, you know, kind of challenges and pay, pain points specifically in cross-border payments. I don't know if you can, you can address those. Um, yeah, I think many of them I talked about earlier, the local acquiring um, being important and local payment methods to improve authorization rates and payment methods. Uh, the other aspect, of course, is fraud making sure that you can guarantee, we can guarantee to our clients a zero chargeback risk, both on the payment side and on the friendly forward, forward on shipping when, when um, it's maybe shipped to uh, incorrect addresses or, or declined. Uh, so we own that um, as a service provider so that brands don't have to become experts on international fraud. You know, I, as we look at this, you know, kind of next slide, right? How can you provide you know, provide localized e-commerce experiences. And, you know, this is truly, I think, a, you know, such a significant opportunity. And, and this is something that, that we at Coresight think about a lot, right, is how to, you know, first of all, many times it's the consumer's first interaction with the brand, right? They've, they've heard about it, they've, they've dreamed of it, and, and now it's kind of a, a reality. And so I, I love this slide. It, it, it speaks to, to so much of what I, I, I think about, right? Which is, you know, if we want to start at the top, right? You know, kind of cultivating demand with like localized marketing. And, and you know, there was a question actually for, for Nikki, um, which was in the, from the audience and thank you um, around, have you used live streaming or, or how have you kind of, you know, 
gotten your, your brand and, and how have you kind of tailored your, your marketing? Yeah, so actually we have not used live stream for customer experience, I think was the question. And I, I have seen that starting to become a trend as customers are more um, comfortable with Zoom and other uh, video providers to, to be able to consult with a customer experience representative. Uh, but in, in terms of marketing, uh, I think that, as you mentioned, social media is, is not, you know, is not a domestic tool. It's an international tool that we connect with so many different potential consumers and consumers with. Uh, so, you know, I think social media has been a huge driver for us. And also um, our email marketing strategy, it, Flow has helped to uncover different nations uh, so clearly and, and different product assortments that different nations are maybe gravitating towards. So we've actually tailored our marketing, email marketing, SMS marketing, and social media strategies around, um, you know, which which customers might kind of gravitate to certain products and and what they and you know really just personalize the experience for them. Well, I think that that's also really critical, Rob. Right now, right where we're, you know, especially in Europe, uh, where you know we're we're continuing to see this this ebb and flow in terms of stores being open and stores being closed. And you know we're we're hearing a significant demand from you know many specialty retailers as they're trying to understand you know kind of cross border e commerce, right? How do they you know first of all understand the demand, but then also right if, if they're going to kind of you know jump in, how do they translate? Especially Europe, right, where you have you know so many different languages, and even in certain countries, right, you have have many languages. Can you can you address that because I know it's. It's a conversation we've had many times, and and what I don't know if we always allay everybody's fears, but that is, uh, you know, with, with flow, I think there's there's huge opportunity. Yeah, um, we encourage brands to don't not try to get the perfect shopping experience in 200 different countries, but just start off and peel away the onion layers one by one, open up the world, make sure there's a decent shopping experience for each country, um, and iterate from there. So on the question of, I mean, I, I think the table stakes is making sure you've got local currency and that they're cleanly rounded prices, whether those are price books or using exchange rates and then rounding, either or, Nikki mentioned both of those earlier, uh, making sure duties and taxes are displayed and shipping is cheap and efficient and payment methods available. I think that's table stakes for a decent international shopping experience. And then from there, you can build on it. You can tweak different country experiences at Flow, we've got deep um, testing built into the platform. So our client success work with uh, the client partners to find the perfect setting and test different setups. Similarly on language, you're asking about language with pre-translated checkouts where language is more of an issue because there are, it looks complicated and it may be off-putting to see it in a different language where there may be less of a business case to do that on the product pages. You may have thousands of SKUs and product pages, and there may not be a business case for managing the language on each of those, particularly if it's a very visual page. But I think the main message is get out there, do it, turn on the countries with a decent shopping experience, and then invest from there. Don't try to spend years preparing for the perfect shopping experience before launching. I, I, I have to say there's, there's definitely some uh, brands, I mean, we've been working with for quite some time, and, and there is this, I mean, one in particular has been like three years because it, they're, they're so concerned about everything just being absolutely perfect. And I do think this idea of like, just jump in, try it and test it. And right now, right, we don't, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And, and I think that that is, you know, really an important point. And especially I think with the, the speed that, that Nikki alluded to, it, it is kind of really um, mission, you know, mission critical. You know, I, I think that um, one, one other question I have for you, Rob, and, and would love to hear what, you know, kind of Nikki's experience has been, right, where, you know, once again, by, you know, kind of geo, right, consumers are used to whether it's an embedded video or, right, you know, it's, you know, kind of many more, right, like PDPs so that they can better understand the product. It sounds like, you know, you, you have this incredibly, once again, localized approach. Can you talk about just, you know, how, how you think about that? Because it is certainly different by geography. Yeah. Um, I mean, there, there are broadly two approaches. You can either start building out specific site content by country or, or by culture. Uh, that may need different instances. So on Shopify, you may need to have as many different instances as you want to have localized content. Um, or you can rely 
on converting them on a single instance. Keep it visual and keep the shopping experience that's being localized to pricing and promotions and advertising and driving them on the paid marketing front, but not investing and changing your site each time. Uh, most of the clients we see are in that second category. Um, they're not trying to develop the perfect in-country uh, shopping experience with different content each time. The business case doesn't seem to be there for that, but rather want to fine tune the settings so the shopping experience is highly tuned at Flow. And that's what we do at Flow. We help them on all the things we talked about. Um, we try not to touch the content side of a client site and leave that for them to decide if they want to develop specific region, region specific content. So Nikki, I mean, what has Lula Johnson done to localize its, its e-commerce experiences? Because to me, this is often, you know, the, the greatest challenge for a brand. Yeah, certainly. So, you know, first and foremost, I think we kind of took the approach that Rob had mentioned, like we, we turned on, we turned on and then we assessed where we were at. We got the pulse of what some of the analytics looked like and where there was opportunity or missed opportunity. And from there, I think we started to build out some localized strategies and A-B testing to then better understand if something was going to work better in an experience. Um, and to put some color around that, uh, Canada, for example, we, we started to see that our order volume was there, but our AOV was maybe lower. So a Canadian customer was a bit more price sensitive. So we realized that shipping rates to Canada were actually not, you know, were quite expensive for the products that they were shipping, um, that we were shipping to Canada. So what we ran was an AB test, uh, free shipping versus not free shipping within Canada. We promoted on the free shipping experience a site-wide banner that said now offering free shipping to Canada. Um, and of course you only got that if you were in the experience where shipping was free. And we, we saw through the data that there was an uptick in sales from consumers and uh, who had free shipping. Not only was there an increase in overall sales, we did see that our AOVs tended to increase in our AURs. So people were adding more to their cart um, with, with kind of that uh, barrier taken down of shipping. So for us, that was how we catered that localized experience within uh, Canada, but we continuously look to evolve within each nation or each region. Um, based on the data that we're seeing, we kind of then go with strategies on how we can localize and optimize. And can I ask you a follow-up to that, which is, you know, because right now, you know, the world is really your oyster. How are you kind of prioritizing, you know, different geographies and how is Flow helping you kind of also understand the opportunity and, you know, kind of optimize for these, you know, different customer tastes and preferences? Yeah, um, so I think we've definitely seen a high affinity for English speaking countries with our product, you know, Canada, UK, uh, various parts of Europe, Australia, and, you know, that's, that's kind of baseline and, and we've always known we've had an interest there, but what really, uh, you know, Flow had helped us to really shed light on some new areas of opportunity, such as the Netherlands and Singapore and, um, you know, the UAE and, and all these kind of other micro areas where there are these really loyal, dedicated customers. Um, and we've started to kind of cater to these customers in a different way and treating them like VIP and royalty. I mean, they're spending upwards of $20,000 with us uh, since we've launched. And that, that's a customer that we want to keep and we want to keep engaged and interested. So uh, I, I think the visibility and, and um, the way that we're able to really zoom in and zoom out has helped us to, to grow the overall kind of uh, global business. No, that's, that's really helpful. I mean, I, I think that, you know, as we, you know, kind of um, look ahead a few slides and just kind of think about, you know, the, you know, impact of, of what we've seen in, in kind of 2020. I mean, Rob, these, these numbers are just truly outstanding. I mean, you know, what, what's your take? I mean, to me, it's just kind of like almost like a pause and reflect on, on where, you know, what, what we went through last year in terms of just the significant growth, but also I think it speaks to what's ahead, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of research has gone into the question, I think from course, course and others, um, what has COVID meant for e-commerce and what's going to look like post-COVID? And I think uh, it goes without saying that it's accelerated e-commerce purchases over the last 12 months. I think year on year, we've seen over 100% growth in e-com uh, through our clients on average relative to the prior year. Um, 
what does it mean post-COVID? I think there's a lot of first-time buyers, first-time either e-commerce or first-time cross-border buyers who have now done it the first time and over time will become habitual cross-border buyers. And I think clearly that's the future that's opening up consumers feeling comfortable purchasing uh, without regard to where the merchant is. And what our goal with clients is to make sure that the shopping experience is so clean, easy, cheap for the end consumer that they become loyal fans from that point onwards. And I think COVID, uh, for all its misfortune for society, has helped e-commerce in an enormous way to introduce a whole new segment, a large segment of consumers globally to cross-border shopping. Nikki, can you talk to the you know experience that you know that you've seen over the um, holidays and you know just in general? I think if we can uh, you know look through your results. Yeah. Um, so I, I can kind of speak to these numbers and what they mean for us. But the international is about three percent of our sales prior to launching on Flow. And since launching, we have now seen that it's picked up to 16% of our total sales, which is just incredible from, as I mentioned, turning on a tool. Since this um, kind of number has been recorded, we even worked to further optimize and, and kind of localize those experiences. And now we're kind of seeing the last two months we've been trending at 18%. So um, first and foremost, that was that turnkey solution I mentioned. And then we continue to evolve as, as we tweak and optimize. Um, 75% uh, decrease in delivery speed. So as mentioned before, we were shipping to California, California then shipping out. So that kind of window has significantly reduced. Um, we are able to ship with DHL Express within three to five days. Um, I mean, to ship to Australia within four or five days, like that's just incredible. It's halfway across the world or more. Um, and then we've seen a 4.5% in uh, just overall 4.5% increase in our gross sales um, since last year, which is obviously speaks to the tools that we now have at our disposal. And then 64 is the amount of countries that we've shipped to uh, since launching with Flow. And, and we launched in March. So uh, we, we are also missing all of Q1 here if we're looking at this on an annual kind of term, but this is really within three quarters. So it's, it's really exciting to see. I mean, the, the 64 number is just, I mean, I, I'm, I'm almost speechless because it's, yeah. it, this really sums it up because I, I, I think that, you know, there, there are also so many brands who are you know, kind of on the precipice, you know, this is something that would be great. Like I said, we have, we actually have one client we've been spending three years on, you know, just this, this very topic, but this just shows you, right. Just kind of like, you know, jump in with, with both eyes open and, and both feet. And I mean, you just don't know the possibilities until you try it. Right. Nikki. Absolutely. And, you know, I think we've, we've recognized what we call power shoppers in some of these regions. Uh, we, we've seen people in Brazil shopping. We've seen, you know, there, there is a customer out there. Uh, and, and in our case, she's usually a she, but, and she's out there and she's, dedicated and comes back for more and more and she's not just a first-time customer she's a repeat customer and it's just really amazing to see kind of the global scale in which we have these power shoppers and how that all really sums up to kind of our total and then you know obviously helps to supplement the key markets that we already know we have a loyal customer base in great and i know we're we're almost sending you know kind of the the, the close of this amazing conversation. Um, but I, I do want to at least address a few of the, the audience questions. And, you know, if we can look at, you know, what is the single most challenging aspect of launching a global strategy? And I think, you know, Nikki and Rob, we'd love to hear from you both. Um, I think, I don't know about a challenge or opportunity, but I think there's a category of things, which is you can't expect the perfect experience out of the box. So Nikki's hands-on approach at Ula is fantastic. And I think that she is to credit for such an enormous lift, nearly 500% growth in international sales. Um, but beyond the sudden change, the step change to an improved customer experience out of the box with Flow, it requires work to dig into each market then to find, to test different settings. Uh, Nikki was referring earlier to a free shipping promotion test. And that's what we see working with many of our clients. Our client success team will lean in and try to guide or do on behalf of our clients to see how can we take the top 10, 20 markets and test different configurations because 
the right answer, the perfect customer experience varies not just by geography, but by category and even by brand. So there is no one size fits all. But that's the challenge and opportunity. Keep working at it. Take your top 10, 20 markets where maybe 80% of your international sales will come from and test different settings. What promotions work best? What price rounding rules work best? Uh, how should we display duties and taxes for maximum conversion rates? Uh, what payment methods should be displayed in which order? Um, which shippers should we offer? There's all kinds of questions. There's about 70 or 80 different tests that we run at Flow. And any one of them could lead to a 34% lift in conversion rates. And once you start stacking them on, you can quickly get to triple digit conversion rate improvement. For me, that's the biggest opportunity and uh, effort required when you've launched with Flow. And I think, Nikki, the, you know, the, the slide that you know, kind of was the, the big aha, I think, for, for many of us, you know, if you want to think about you know, kind of taking the, the other side of it, not the challenge, but, but the opportunity, you know, if you can help us kind of go back just in your mind to, to when you decided to work with Flow and, and where you are now, I mean, I would assume that, you know, the, the growth has been, you know, kind of nothing short of, of exponential, but where, where do you still see opportunity and, you know, what does that mean for 21? Yeah, um, I think we continue to see opportunity in adjusting some of our price books. Um, we, you know, historically have been a, a wholesale driven brand. And I think over the last five years have seen a significant increase in our direct to consumer kind of arm of our business. And for us, uh, what what's kind of was a challenge and now is not such a challenge and where there's continuous opportunity is really in price books. For some of our biggest regions, our product that is so well known to our customer ends up being so expensive for them. And that's really a deterrent, um, especially when looking at the competitive landscape and like-minded brands that are maybe European brands that can offer a more competitive price point. So for us, I think it's been really helpful to set our own price books and to understand as a brand where we want to take certain hits um, to then gain a, a wider audience. So, you know, we can tweak our pricing so that it's it's more competitive so that we can only capture that much more demand. And we have the ability to do that and to play with that on a skew by skew basis. And our catalog is extensive. We upload about 120 to 140 products every six to eight weeks. So for us, having that level of flexibility is, is kind of unheard of. So um, I think that continues to be an area of opportunity and growth for us to play around with some of those numbers and then really take that back to the team too and, and adjust our buying strategy. This is uh, our first year of working with Flow, but I think for next year, we're really thinking through what does this mean in, in our planning and our merchandising strategies and how does this affect uh, our vertical production arm are we going to leave goods overseas before importing them and and i think that you know it started here but now it's becoming a kind of much more involved converse, conversation internally that affects many different team members and key players i'm not sure i've ever used this in a sentence but i'm, I'm absolutely gobsmacked by by this <laughs> nikki i mean it really is because it's <laughs> Right, it's all in the numbers, and and I think that you know as, as we look to kind of wrap up our conversation today. Although this is you know my favorite topic, you know for for retailers who are looking to go global, right? I mean, you just kind of have to jump in and you know roll up your sleeves and you know kind of you know test and learn. And I think that you know Nikki and Rob talked to us a lot about this today. You know, for twenty one, I, I do think that we're going to continue to see uh, significant growth in e commerce on a global scale. And you know, certainly due to, to some of the restrictions, but also right in 2020, we had many consumers who had not shopped online before who are now online customers. And it is completely changing, right? The way that you know consumers look to, I think, learn about new brands, experience, and and also, right, there's always that you know feeling of discovery, right? You know, if I you know, if I end up being kind of this, right, like key opinion customer and I've discovered Ula Johnson, then I can tell my friends, right? You know, it, it goes back to kind of elevating one's social status, but also this idea that, you know, there, there are these, these amazing brands that, you know, are, are yet to be discovered still by some. And then in terms of compelling markets, right? I mean, we, like I mentioned early on, we've, we've had a lot of inbounds and, in, you know, we're five, six weeks into to 21 on specifically Southeast Asia. And I will say in the, the back half of, of 20, there was also a lot of interest in South America. So I think these kind of non-European 
you know, kind of countries and, and regions where, you know, I think that retailers are like, wow, this, this seems interesting. They're, they're big markets. And, and we haven't even, right, like thought about it, right? Many have thought about going to Europe. They haven't done it. So, so that to me is, you know, kind of first in some cases on the list and then expanding to some of these others. And so I, I think that, you know, lastly, just to kind of, you know, sum it all up, there's huge opportunities in, in global cross-border and, you know, having a partner like Flow, I think completely changes the, you know, the ability for one to, to make what can be a difficult decision, right? Whether it's, you know, for a board or a C-suite. And so I, I think that, you know, having this opportunity, Rob and Nikki, to chat with you today is truly, uh, truly my pleasure. And uh, I wish everyone all the luck in, in 21. Uh, for those on the call, we have a Retail Tech Innovator Showcase next week and hope you can join us and Rob and Nikki, thanks for an amazing conversation. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki.